Levitansky moved from uh, Santa Monica um, to Sumy, Ukraine. So maybe we'll start with why you moved and, uh, and then we'll move on from there. So a bit of prehistory and then we'll get into, into, into modern day. And maybe you could talk a little bit about your arrival uh, and everything to do with that. Um, okay, so I uh, grew up in Simcha, Monica, California. My father, Olav Shalom, was the second Chabad Shliach to the state of California. And um, California grown Shliach. So Shlichos is my life, uh, reaching out to people. This is from uh, my childhood. Um, how I ended up in Ukraine is a long, long story. Um, I was here as a uh, bacher when I was studying in yeshiva. Afterwards, I was uh, in Kharkov, actually, which is three hours from now, and a very large city that needs our tefillahs very much yesterday and today again. Um, and then uh, I was offered to come to Sumi, which is a much smaller city. And uh, that really, one, one of the main things that pushed me to come here is when I was here, before I got married, it was very inspiring to see the Jewish people here who have gone through 70, 80 years of communism, but they were thirsty for anything Jewish. Um, I watched um, youth go from learning Aleph Bays to going into yeshiva in a span of a year and a half or two. Uh, people just want to learn more. They want to do more. They're, they're, they, they're thirsty to be a part of their Jewish heritage. And um, it was very inspiring to me. I, I felt like this is a place that I, I want to go to. Um, Sumi is not a place that many people are coming to to do what I'm doing, um, especially Americans. Most of the Shluchim out in Ukraine are from Israel a little closer and the mentality may be even a little similar um but uh, here i am so uh i'll try to answer that question with an answer that i think will answer a lot of other questions that we that you might have about uh what it is to be a shliach or to go somewhere where it's foreign language is foreign the Culture is foreign, everything is foreign. The fact that they like, turn off the water at 10 o'clock at night or electricity might go out just for no reason, um, etc. cetera. Um, when I came here, I had to renew my visa every three months and it was getting very difficult. The red tape that was involved was really, it, was, it took up a lot of my time. And so I eventually hired a lawyer a local lawyer and I asked them to please do all the paperwork for me and you know every three months basically renew the visa. Um, after five years I'm assuming that he also got tired of doing it and he said uh, there's a law that allows you to apply for residency if you were living here for five years and you own property. By that time we already had bought a property for our Chabad house for our mixed um, so I applied for residency. Now this application is subject to the um, to the head of head of uh, immigration in my county, and that person has discretion to approve or disapprove for whatever reason they see fit. Um, but you have nothing to lose. So we applied and filled out the whole form. And then this lawyer came up with a brilliant idea. He said, you're already here for five years. You connected with government officials. Why don't you ask the governor to put in a good word for you instead of just putting in the application like anybody else, you know, have the governor put the application in for you. So we did that. Uh, two weeks later, I got uh, an answer that I was denied the application. However, the head of immigration wanted to see me. So uh, I came to pick up my papers and uh, the head of immigration said to me, this is a woman, and she says, I read your application and I denied it, I denied the application. And technically I don't have to give you a reason for, for the denial. 
but because you are connected with the governor, you came and you applied to the governor, I feel like I owe you some kind of an explanation. So I'm gonna tell you why I denied the application. Um, the reason is because after reading the whole application and the reason why I need to have residency in Sumy, Ukraine, she said, I, uh, I can't accept this uh, explanation. And the only thing that I can, uh, the only reason why I can think of that somebody should move with his entire family from Los Angeles to Sumy, Ukraine, is that either you're in, involved in some kind of espionage, you're a spy for some government, or you're just not normal, you're crazy. And we don't need spies and we don't need Michigan. So uh, I, I can't honestly give you, you know, stamp your, your, your application. Um, I, I, I said to her, I, I accept what you say. I, it makes sense to me. And if I were in your, in your position, I might've done the same thing, but I do wanna thank you that you're giving me a government stamp of approval that what I'm doing is crazy because the Rebbe teaches us that when we do things in a holy way that are crazy, that's how we change this world to be a better place. So if we're doing good things and it's crazy, we're definitely changing the world for better. And that's uh, really one of the main reasons why I'm here in Sumi, to make this world a better place. So Thank I you. hope I answered your question, Rabbi. You answered um, So maybe we could fast forward to the present day. Um, I guess the question is, uh, people, this did not happen overnight. Um, how did you guys prepare um, uh, for, for what you thought was going to happen? And maybe talk about just daily life at the moment or leading up to it and then at the moment. Okay, so we, we, we are here now with our family, um, seven, 17 plus years already, Baruch Hashem. Um, actually, five of my children are studying outside of the country, and they're, and they're the ones that feel they're being left out. Um, the four younger ones are here with me and my wife. Um, and over the span of 17 years, we've built up a, quite a nice community with a shul and a preschool and after school program, a mikvah. Um, we have classes for men every day, a minion every day, um, women's classes a few times a week, uh, and so on, like would go on in any other community. And to be very, very honest and frank, nobody expected this to happen. So as far as preparing for what was coming, um, the only reason why I knew that I should be preparing somewhat is because I was listening to messages that I was getting from outside of Ukraine, um, from all my relatives and friends in America and Israel and, and, and the American embassy and the Israeli embassy. Um, I was getting calls from reporters up until uh, Wednesday night that were asking me, you know, when are you, when are you leaving? What's your plan? What's with the Russian invasion? And I, I had nothing to tell them. Like, what, what, what are you talking about? People over here were sure that this would never happen. They were 100% sure that this would never happen. And they weren't going anywhere. And to be honest, that we're here with our community. And if they're not going, then we're not going. So um, we, we did prepare a little bit. And some of the bigger cities or cities that are closer to uh, Poland actually did a lot of more, a lot more preparing because some people started leaving earlier already. So they were already getting involved in helping people cross the border, helping people um, while they're on their way to the border. Um, but Thursday morning, I must say, caught us by surprise. Thursday morning, when we heard the sirens, I told my children that that's the chauffeur of Mashiach. Before Mashiach comes, the chauffeur is going to blow. We heard sirens, and I said, I'm sure that that is the chauffeur of Mashiach. I'm still sure every time I hear the siren, I'm sure it's the chauffeur of Mashiach. It just hasn't happened yet. It didn't, uh, it didn't actualize, but, but it, it didn't make any sense. There was no... And I, I got 
phone calls, you know, we have sirens, got phone calls that there's Russian invasion. People didn't believe it. A lot of people still don't believe it. Um, they wake up in the morning and they pinch themselves and they say, this is a dream. It doesn't make any sense. It's impossible. Um, I don't know if anyone here is from Ukraine or from Russia or, or this area or has relatives here, but um, if you do, then you, you, you understand the, the, I don't know, the, how, how crazy this really is. Ukraine, when we came here, the Ukrainian border with Russia was not a border. It was, there was, it was open. There was no, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was more open than the border between Canada and, and the United States. It was just like you know, a total open border until 2014. Um, it, it was literally one, not one country, but I mean, just people going over. There are cities in the Sumskaya region which are on both sides of the border, meaning the border runs between the city. In, in, in the, the border runs down the center of the city. There's no fence because it's, it's, it's a city. Now there are fences. Now they've split cities in half. So it's, it's unfathomable. What, what happened was really unfathomable. And um, when it did happen, we began to mobilize immediately uh, trying to buy as much uh, supplies that we can, knowing that uh, we're going to need them. Um, and we're still doing that. Today, the stores still had some supplies. Um, tomorrow, I'm hoping that they'll still have some supplies. So we're trying to buy as much as we can. Um, helping uh, another thing which helped us also was that uh, Corona has been in our lives for two years now. And um, it taught us how we can communicate online with our community. And we have groups, WhatsApp groups and, and messaging. And, um, and we basically have been delivering goods to people who are homebound for two years already or more, but for sure for the past two years. So we have a system in place to help people. Of course, this is a whole different level that uh, it's only becoming a reality now and was there a thought for you to leave did you have an opportunity to do so and why didn't you i did have an opportunity to leave up until thursday morning thursday afternoon even maybe um, the thought to leave never crossed my mind um, and i can tell you from the feeling on the ground of people, I'm talking about mainly non-Jewish people because they're the majority here. Um, when I'm out in the street now and I go to buy things in the stores, people see me, they come up to me and they thank me that I did not leave them. Um, the feeling over here is that the only reason why um, we are where we are right now and uh, things aren't worse than, than what they, or what people imagine that they can be, and hopefully they won't be, is because Jewish people around the world are praying for us. That is what the local people are telling me. Yesterday, I, I was called by, the, by one of the representatives in the church over here. She wanted to get some of some humanitarian aid for older people in you know in the city that they're helping, and she said the Jewish people have been three over three thousand years ago. The Jewish people came up with matzah. They knew they were going out on the road and they needed food for a long time, and they created matzah, and that's what's going to save us now. Do you have extra matzah so that we can give to people so that they should have in their homes? They can hold on, you know, they can have matzah. And she, she said the, the social media is full of, um, of compliments from Jewish people, Jewish people saying that they're praying for Ukraine and it's an incredible help for everybody. People, they just, they, they, they're, they, they love it. They're saying, this is what's keeping us together. Um, and the community over here, they, they ask me every day, you're still here? You mean you're really still here? You're, you're not joking. You're really still here. So yeah, I'm here with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. When you're here, we're calm. If you're here, that means things are good. 
I don't think I would forgive myself if I left my community behind and you know said, hey guys, I have an American passport, so you know, have a good day. Um, they they do they feel that there is a little bit of a resentment in the air because a lot of the organizations, even the you know the embassies, they they fled, you know, and people have this um, this thought going through their head, hey, we're we're here, we're we're you know we don't have where to go, and we're relying on you. Why why are you leaving us behind? Why are you just running away and saying you know sorry, have a good day? Um, but that's the reality. Uh, and and when they see me here, it's a comfort to them. And definitely, um, if that's what I can do for the community, then I'm here. That's incredibly powerful and very humbling. And I think that uh, you know, for us to come and get inspiration from you, um, as opposed to the other way around, is just is just amazing and uh, very emotional. Just thinking about it. I, I want to ask, um, walking through the streets, is there fear from everyone? What's the actual day-to-day -day life like at the moment? Okay, so it changes from day-to-day, -day, from hour to hour. Um, in the beginning, it was more outside of the city. So it was um, the outskirts of the city. We're, we are, I don't know if you know the geography of Ukraine, but Sumi, I think I think give a bit of a yeah give a bit now of a everybody geography lesson. Huh? Now now everybody's done their homework. Um, Sumi is on the border. We're literally um, thirty minutes thirty minute drive to Russia, and uh, and the Sumsky region takes up about half of the northern border with Russia. It's it's, it's, a, it's a very very long border. And then east of here is Kharkov, and then you have Lugansk and Donetsk. Lugansk and Donetsk is where the fighting has been going on since 2014. And now it's coming um, westward or northward, whatever you want to call it, um, to Kharkov, which is very heavy past two days. Um, and in Sumy, it's mainly because we're on the main road from Moscow to Kiev. So uh, technically, the, you know, most of the fighting that was happening around the cities here was because they were on their way to Kiev. And they basically um, put all the cities on the way to Kiev into a lock hole. So we're, our city is pretty much surrounded. And every evening, usually, at least, I mean, it's been four evenings now, um, we have curfew and lights have to go out. The city lights go out. It's, uh, it's, it's like the plague of darkness, literally. I, I mean, the darkness outside is eerie. Um, and then you just start hearing the, you know, booms, boom, 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 boom. Um, and you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going to. It's just going on on a regular basis and then it'll be quiet and then you'll hear it again. And then you hear the sirens, which means that there are rockets coming in or something that can be more dangerous for the, you know, within the city. So everybody has to go to the bunkers and people scramble to go to, um, to go to the bunkers. These bunkers are from two, they're, they're from the second world war and nothing has changed since then. Nobody, um, <laughs> nobody did anything with them since then. And nobody was expecting this. So it wasn't like, you know, I mean, literally like going into a, a uh, cellar that has been sitting for 50, 60, 70 years untouched, that's full of dust and mud and garbage and who knows what. And uh, people are cramped in there and that's what's happening. We have a basement in our home and every time there's a siren, the neighbors from all around come to, to our house for, for shelter, it's Jews and non-Jews. Um, and uh, that that's pretty much what it's what it's been. We've been, you know, you're in your house. Uh, curfew now. Now they extended it from six to six, basically, from six in the evening to six in the morning. Um, and during the day, uh, most people don't go out. People go out just to buy a few things and get back into their house. Um, today, I, I I've been driving around a lot because I've been 
delivering things to people in the community and also people on the streets. Um, people are, you know, people are standing in lines, they need food. If there are children, families of children or whatever it is, I, I drive around and I hand out, um, I'm handing out basic food needs, rice, um, flour, oil, you know, things that people could use to just uh, have for, for a few days. And about three o'clock in the afternoon, the Ukrainian army basically starts taking over and, you know, the cars start disappearing and it becomes desolate. And that, yeah, it's very scary, very scary. To be out in the street is, is not, um, not comfortable at all. So tell us how are your children coping with this? Uh, okay, so children are uh, innocent. And uh, for a long time, for enough of a long time, I tried to keep it out of their, you know, or keep, I should say, the action out of their life. Um, maybe I'm, I'm naive and I b really believe that this wasn't happening and it's going to end very, very soon. And, you know, I, I won't have to disclose what's going on, but unfortunately, it's, uh, it's a reality and it's in their life. We've uh, spoken to them and... Now, I mean, they, they sleep in the basement because uh, no reason for them to hear the sirens and have to run and you know, take cover. Uh, so they're missing out on a, maybe a lot of the action maybe, but they, they, know, they know that it's there. Um, thank God they don't understand the seriousness of it, but uh, they, it, it's there. Hopefully it won't become too, too much of their life. We, our children are an online school. Uh, for those who don't understand what that is, the, the shulchan around the world have created a school online. So um, when Corona hit and everybody was trying to figure out how to get their kids in school without being in a building, the shulchan around the world had the answer about 15 years before that. And um, my children log in every morning to their class and they have uh, friends from all over the world who are, who are part of their class and this is their, you know, their life. So when they announced that schools are closing down because there's a war, my kids didn't feel that. They, they came in the morning and they were in school because school continued. Thank God our internet didn't go down and our electricity is still on. We have a generator just in case, but uh, the internet could be disrupted. And so they've been in school, they've been in school and their day is pretty much the same as it was until now, just that they know that we can't go outside so much and we can't, uh, you know, we're, we're limited to it and, and they feel it. They, they hear also children are very smart. My sister taught your uh, daughter in online school, by the way. Um, wow. <laughs> When she saw that you got you were joining us, she said, "Ah, so um, tell us about Shabbos. How was Shabbos? And how many? Maybe start with a bit about the Jewish community. How many Jews are there in your city?" Um, okay, so quickly, one of the one of the first questions I always get: How many Jews in your city? How many Jews in Ukraine? There's no answer to that question. Anybody who answers that question is just taking a guess. Jews in Ukraine have been, um, again, four generations, 80 years, 90 years, by now it's already 100 years of, you know, since communism. And during the years of communism, people hid the fact that they were Jewish. They would take it out of their passports, even though then it was in their passport, they would stamp them Jewish. Um, but people, if they had an opportunity, they would take it out of their passports. They, they didn't want their children to know that they were Jewish. They would change their last names so that their name is not Rabinovich anymore. It's Ivanovich. Um, they, they tried to hide the fact that they were Jewish in any way they could. So when you're talking about great or great, great grandchildren of these people who lived before communism started, there's a very large amount of people who just don't know. They have no clue. They don't know that they're Jewish. Besides for that, um, Russian 
and the Ukrainian um, idea of Jewish is that it's a nationality and it's, uh, it, it goes by the father. So people really believe if their name is Rabinovich, they're Jewish. Although not necessarily is that a fact, if their mother is not Jewish, if their mother's mother is not Jewish, then they're not Jewish. Their name is Rabinovich and all their life they suffered because they're Jewish. And here you tell them that they're not Jewish. Then you have somebody who's Petrovich or Ivanovich and he knew that he was Ukrainian all his life. And then he finds out that his mother's mother was Jewish. And now all of a sudden you're telling him that he's 100% Jewish and he can't understand what, what happened. So it, th there's no way of knowing. Um, we have about 400 people, 400 Jewish people in our community that we're in touch with, that we've checked their documents, that we, we know that they're Jewish. Um, and I would say about half of those people did not know they were Jewish 10 years ago or 15 years ago. They discovered it by going through the archives, by speaking to their relatives, their grandparents, parents, whatever it is. Um, my guess is that in Sumi there's about 3,000 Jews, but if someone told me that there's 10, I wouldn't be surprised. And throughout Ukraine, our guess is there's about a half a million Jews. Um, out of those, the Jewish communities throughout Ukraine are um, active people in the communities or people who were in touch is about 200,000. And the community has food at the moment, so there's supplies. And how are you, you say you're buying and distributing, how are you doing this? In my car. And how, but if there's scarce supplies, you're going to literally shops, wholesalers, how are you affording yeah, it? Charities I, are spending money? I, I'm connected with, um, I've been here long enough to be, to have connections in the government and in, and with also chain stores. Um, they know me already and they, they're helping us basically to locate um, places where we can get a certain amount of this, a certain amount of that. And I'm also in touch with the community to find out what they really need. So I try to basically make that connection. Um, Baruch Hashem for, for today, for tomorrow, you know, we're, we're, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. Um, we're a little bit ahead of the game more than other people, but it's changing as we speak. And uh, nobody knows. Nobody knows what's going to be. A lot of it also depends on cash, on money. The, the, the less there is, the more expensive it is, and the di more difficult it is to get. So you have to pay, you know, pay in, so to say, to get what you want. Um, also, medications are becoming less available. So that's also something that we try to get as much of. And I should add that it, this, this is different throughout Ukraine because Ukraine is a huge country and cities that are west of Kiev are, are dealing with um, people who are running away and they're dealing with uh, feeding them and housing them. Uh, we had one family from Sumy that left Thursday early morning to go to the Polish border and as we speak now, about an hour and a half ago, they were in touch with me and they said, we hope that within two or three hours, we'll cross the border. That's Thursday, Friday, Shabbos, Sunday, Monday. Five days on the road um, with two children in their car and they can't leave their car. They're just waiting in, in a car line, which is 20 kilometers long to try to get out of, the, you know, to wait to get out of the border. Um, so it's difficult for them, and the shluchim in those areas are dealing with um, with those types of people. Um, east of Kiev, where we are, we're dealing with being in a in a siege, basically, and not not having any way to get in or out or to get products in or out. And um, even the humanitarian aid, which officially is coming from Israel and from Europe. Um, that's going to come to Pol the Polish border or the Hungarian border. Regardless, it's a thousand kilometers from here. 
um, there's no air, um, nothing, nothing is flying besides for army airplanes. So even if they get humanitarian aid to the border today, it's not coming to Sumi for another two days minimum. And even if it does come, and if there's anything left for it when it does come, not necessarily will we get it. Uh, so that's why, yeah, that, that's why we're that's what we're doing now every day from from when I can get out from six thirty in the morning until about four o'clock in the afternoon. I'm out in the street trying to collect as much as I could. And are, are you able to get when when people fundraise? Do the funds come to you? You you're able to today. We were able to get. Um, it's a miracle. And I'm praying for the miracle to continue. Um, on Friday, I was able to take uh, to get funds, and I thought that that was it. And, you know, this, after Shabbos, it's not going to be a chance. And Sunday, we waited with, uh, we held our breath. But today, Baruch Hashem, the bank system was working, and uh, funds that were collected came straight to our account, and we were able to use them. We did. We couldn't take out cash. You can't take any cash, but the credit cards or the bank system is working, and you can pay by credit card. And uh, it's liter that was literally a savior for me today. If you could post a link, I don't know if you have one. Well, I'll send it out to the community we later. Have, yeah, we have a link. I'll send it to you. you put it into. Send it to me. I'll put it onto the chat. Um, tell us. I, I I asked the question before. I don't know if you heard it. Tell us about Shabbos. So in 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 the diaspora where we are. So uh, where at Shabbos, we were spending our time and we were davening and thinking about you guys. Um, but maybe you can give us a bit of color as to how Shabbos was. Okay, so uh, Shabbos is usually very nice in Sumi. Um, this Shabbos, obviously, we could not uh, have a minion or anything of the sort. We were told, actually, um, Shabbos, we were told it was going to be serious bombardment and uh, people were bracing for the worst. That was, I think, the at, at that point was the first time that it became a reality that Russian tanks were actually rolling through the streets, literally. Um, and they rolled through the streets of Sumi as well before they were um, chased out. And again, that was also part of a miracle, which I don't understand how it happened. Um, but it became a reality that there's no way that we're going to be out in the streets. So uh, we had a Zoom with our community just before Shabbos. And we really, um, people people really feeling it then. And I'm feeling it more now. But uh, I told everybody, there's fire all over the place. They're shooting. They're, there's, uh, our, our response is Shabbat candles. The fire of the Shabbos candles, which in Hebrew is Nerot, Shabbat Kodesh, Neshek. Neshek in Hebrew is ammunition. And our ammunition is that we're going to light Shabbos candles to repel the fire, which is coming from the other direction. Um, we were told that lights have to be out. And so this was a real Shabbos, the way it's, meant, the way it's been in the times of the Talmud where they didn't have electricity and they uh, spent Shabbos by Shabbos light. So we lit Shabbos candles. It was uh, pitch black. It was dark without the Shabbos candles. And um, we davened. We had uh, quite a few, we had about 25 people who are, who are part of, or in our bunker basically, um, staying with us. And uh, we spent Shabbos together. And uh, it was, very quiet, almost the entire Shabbos. I had my phone, I had an, I have an emergency line for the community, if there's any trouble, if there's anything serious, they knew that they can call me. And even though it was Shabbos, I would, I would answer that, that phone. And nothing, you know, there was, there was nothing. So when Shabbos ended, I said, I made an announcement and I said, it seems like there was a ceasefire or something because it was just so quiet and I went to get my phone to check what's going on and the next thing I knew there was this loud boom it was the loudest that we've heard since you know uh, until then and then another one another one the whole the, the house was shaking the city was shaking these booms were just incredibly powerful 
and we had no idea if it was close or it was far. If it was like it was just uh, ridiculous. Um, it was it, it was very petrifying. Um, apparently, it was the Ukrainian army blowing up the supply line of the Russian um, the Russian gas, the petrol that was going to re you know to to get petrol to their tanks that were in kiev already so they were sending um trucks of petrol that were crossing the border from sumi to to go to kiev and as they were passing by on the road outside the city they were attacked and 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 it was those explosions were those trucks exploding um again i i can't verify that 100 percent but that's apparently what it was, and it definitely sounded like it. It was very scary. And then after that, there was a lot of, there was just ongoing fighting. We spent, Matsoi Shabbos, Malav Malka was in the basement. Yeah. Amazing. What are people, how are people feeling about the future? Um, do people, uh, is there a lot of emotional support as well, or are some people surely are panicking? And also kind of a side question, but um, when the scarcity of, food, uh, very, of, very often there's riots and infighting. Um, is that taking place? Is there security concerns of just being around from others? There are security concerns. I can tell you that for myself, I was more worried before this all started. I was more worried that if there's going to be some kind of, you know, I don't know, some kind of action. Nobody thought that it would be at this, in, in, in this, uh, nobody could believe or imagine that it would be so you know, a, a, an all-out invasion, completely, you know, invading Ukraine. Everybody thought that there would be, you know, kind of some some kind of you know, fighting or trouble or something, go, you know, that's going to going to go on. Um, so that was a concern of mine beforehand. And we hired um, a security for the shul and for my home. Um, we had spoken before with the police department and with the I don't know what they call it in England, but like the FBI would be in America. Um, in you know the local, local, local authorities basically are in touch with me. You know until today, um, and they are very they're 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 very alert about all these types of you know different things that could happen, especially because um, as we know, unfortunately, in the past, Jewish people end up suffering from these things and you know Jewish institutions sometimes are the target of uh, people who are trying to cause trouble um, so that was a concern I think people today are less concerned about that because of two reasons number one there's much more to be concerned about when bombs are falling on the city you're not worried about if someone's going to steal from your store I mean it's, it's you're just you just want to make sure that you and your children are alive and that's it. There's very little concern about you know looting or what's going to happen you know outside. Um, and another another thing is that Baruch Hashem again, thank God. I I must say, I, it it has not appeared as of yet. That doesn't mean that it can't happen or it won't. I'm praying that it doesn't. On the contrary, um, there's a huge support of camaraderie between the locals um, and there, there are people that are volunteering, signing up to the army in, in, in thousands, in the thousands. It's, it's uh, um, people who, who wouldn't necessarily join, but as time goes on and as they see how successful they've been to repel the invasion and the more they see how much support they're getting from around the world, it gives them the strength and the courage to fight on. And their people are coming out of their homes. I'm out in the street during the day. There's a, a line of people volunteering to bring blankets, mattresses, um, any, I mean, the, the crazy things that you can think of that you know doesn't doesn't make any sense. Um, in, in conventional warfare, but over here, I mean, talking about empty glass bottles to be used as uh, multiple cocktails and things like that. I, it's like, it, it's, it's 
incredible and sad sometimes to watch what the army here is is equipped with and how successful they've been literally using their hands and feet um but uh, that's the fact and the more that continues the more support they're getting from the local from from the you know from the population people just want they they want to live free they want to live life life, life was very good here um I, I i should i should answer a question that didn't come up yet but i i kind of mentioned it a little bit and it always comes up whenever i speak about ukraine even before this long before this and people have this stigma that Ukrainians are anti-Semitic and uh, during the Second World War, they were worse than the Nazis. And um, there's nationalists, uh, I don't know, again, I don't know how many Ukrainians or Russians there are on here, Banderevsky, um, they made Bogdan Khmelnytsky, Makhshma into a, a war hero. And uh, we're talking about some kind of, uh, this is, it, it's literally propaganda which is, I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. There are anti-Semites everywhere, um, unfortunately, in the entire world. Uh, but if you take, if you, if you do a statistic online, just go online, how many anti-Semitic incidents took place in Ukraine in 2021 and match that up with any state in the United States or any country in, in, in Europe, any, it's maybe 1%, a 10% of that. If I'm not mistaken, the number for 2021 was about 50 or 51 incidents. And incidents we're talking about, you know, a swastika was, was sprayed on the wall. Um, I've lived here now for more than 17 years. I have not been called a name not once in the streets. I feel safer walking at two o'clock in the morning in Sumy, Ukraine than I do in Brooklyn, New York. That's, that's a fact that I'm telling, this is the way it is. Um, people in the streets over here, it's a very religious city. It's a very, um, it's a, more of a smaller city. People know each other. And I walk in the streets, people come up to me and they tell me, Batushka Blagoslavimina, Father bless me. Please bless me, bless my business. Bless, you know, they only have respect. Um, and especially now, again, especially now people are coming up to me from all, all walks of life and uh, just thanking me, thanking the Jewish people for being there for them, for praying for them. Um, it, it's, not, it's not there, it's just not true. It's just not true. I know I, I have a lot of friends in America and all over the world, and they, they think that I'm just trying, you know, I can't say it online. I'm not allowed to say it. No, nobody is stopping me from saying whatever I want. And um, and I, I invite anybody to come here in a normal in a normal time. Uh, it's just it's just not true. I'm not I'm not saying that they're not there aren't anti-Semites and there and that it doesn't exist. What does exist, and I'll say this is that if you read the history books and you read about pogroms and things like that, which took place during, you know, in, in, during the time when there were many Jewish communities in Ukraine that suffered from, from, from Ukrainians, um, the, the Ukrainian people, the farmers, the peasants, and even people living in cities like Sumy, they're very religious and they're very um, like committed to, to the local priest or priests in the city. And they believe them and they'll, they'll trust them. So if uh, this is something that's real and God should save us that it should never happen. But I can see the in reality, I can see that if, uh, if one of the priests in the city would get up in the church on Sunday and start preaching about how you know, Corona was, is the Jews' fault, and we're suffering only because of the Jewish people. And, and you know, it would be week after week after week. He could incite a pogrom. Uh, he could do it with, with anybody. It didn't have to be the Jews. He could do it with, with the Poles or with the, the, with the gypsies or, or with the Russians. It, it doesn't matter. It, the people are very uh, committed to, the, to religion, and they don't really ask a lot of questions 
And it could, it could be incited. So that, yes. And unfortunately, the Jews were, you know, got the raw end of the deal in Ukraine on that, in, in our history. Today, in today's day and age, again, Baruch Hashem, it doesn't happen. We have a menorah, a public menorah in the center of the city. Every Hanukkah and every night of Hanukkah, we light the menorah. The mayor, the governor um, never had an issue, never had a problem. People love it. People come around, all the non-Jewish people, they want to know when is the menorah going up. It, it's a non-issue. Yeah, in, in this area, even when the Jews see the rabbi, they cross the road away from him. So I think it's, it's very special. Um, uh, the, uh, a lot of people are asking about the volunteer forces and whether people are getting involved, whether Jewish people are getting involved. Uh, is that something you encourage or is something you stay out of? I'm apolitical. Um, also, the fact that I'm a rabbi in the city, I'm, I'm not supposed to take any political side in anything, but uh, um, I do not encourage or discourage. Uh, just like I don't encourage or discourage anyone to leave to go to Israel or to any other country if they wanted to leave a week ago, um, I would say, you know, it's your decision. If that's what you feel you want to do, then that's what you should do. And we'll but, you know, I'll support whatever decision they take. Um, I'm not a politician. I'm not a political analy analyst, and I'm not. Uh, I'm not a prophet. I'm a not a for non for profit business. I'm, I do not say prophecies. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I can't tell you. You know, I can just tell you what. If, you, if this is what you decided to do, then I will support it, and I'll be there for you, and I can help you with what with your decision. We do have two boys from our community who are uh, serving in the, in, in the army and you can add their names to your tefillas. Um, one of them is Lova Ben Anna and Alexei Ben Penina. Uh, two boys who are on the front lines, literally on the front lines. Um, and um, their parents are worried. I can tell you that the, the parents the mother of one of the one of these boys called my wife today and she said that her son called her and said that he's going into a you know a more dangerous area could she please pray for him and so she asked my wife if my wife could please put out the word to the community that we should pray for him and please you know can you say to him this is a woman that is not very connected with uh, what she does you know as far as Yiddishkeit is concerned but her, her neshama is waking up. She, she has read Tehillim, I think, more than I have in the past five days. She has her Tehillim with her, and she takes it wherever she goes, and she's just reading Tehillim um, day and night. While uh, people can just send in a few more questions, the hour's getting late, and uh, I'll ask the final questions. But meanwhile, if you want to get your link up, Rabbi David Hansky, so people can donate and it can go straight to the people in your city, we'd really, really appreciate that. Um, there have been a lot of links, and we sent one from the show, but they're going to more general organizations that are distributing, and this will be much more impactful um, on a very direct level. Let's see if I can send you. If you want to WhatsApp it, whatever you want, I'll, I'll figure yeah, it out. Let me try to WhatsApp it to your okay. number. And Okay, uh, I'm waiting for questions, final questions, guys. Anyone who has? Uh, um... Part of the problem, <laughs> you go all the way down. Okay, one second, I found you. Um, Rabbi, I, I suggest that you go, maybe you can click on and make a team for your community or for okay. those communities. Send, send, I think right now we should do it and then we can do that as well. Yeah, so I sent, the, I sent you the link. Oh, okay. Um, okay, okay, I'll, I'll put it on now. Uh, give me a moment. Um, there was a question, but I think you've kind of answered it, but the question is, um, uh, a few things. First of all, um, are, are, do you have any plan or is it literally day by day? Are you trying to figure out a plan or, or you, you just don't think this is, yeah, I don't know even where to go with that question, but. My plan is that Mashiach is coming. Okay. <laughs> that's the plan. That is my plan. That's, that's, plan. that's plan A and that's plan B. 
And as the situation becomes more and more uh, real, that there's literally nothing that we can do besides yeah. for pray and do extra mitzvahs and uh, pull strings <laughs> up there, that something should happen up there. Um, as it becomes more and more that type of a situation, my belief and trust in Hashem becomes more and more and more because, um, and, and the people are telling me the same thing. You really begin to feel that you're not in control and that you're, you're in Hashem's hands. You're in Hashem's hands. And when you're in Hashem's hands, he does what he wants and it's his choice. So the only thing I can do is Davin that he chooses what I think is right. Um, it's, it's, it really, that's, that's what it's come to. So yeah, there are thoughts, there's all different kinds of, you know, things. If something opens up, if there's this, if there's that, you know, would we mobilize? Would we try to get everybody out? Would we, I, you know, at this point, it's not, there's no, there's no reality that's even close to that. I think uh, we can conclude this. We'll all say to Hillam, especially for the two boys, uh, from your community. So I'll post a link to chapter 30. And uh, if you'll read it with us, maybe lead us in it. I think that would be very powerful. So I just, if everyone can click a link and uh, Abed Avitansky will uh, join us and we'll all dive in together for himself, for his family, his children, his community. Okay, we're doing Kapitel Lamed. Kapitel Lamed, yeah. Mizmar Shir Hanukas Habais Le David, Ari Mimcha Adinoi Kidilisoni, Liloi Simachta Evaili, Adinoi Lihoi Shivaiti Elecha, Vatirpa Eni, Adinoi Elisa Min Shaoil Nafshi, Chi Sonny Mior Diver, Zamr Ladinoi Hasidov, Vahoidul Zecher Kotchai, Kidaga Baapoi, Chaim Berzoinoi, Ba Erev Yoming Bechi, Blaboiker Rino, Vanio Marti Beshalvi, Bal Emoit, Le Oilon. Adinoi Berzoincho, He Madito, Lahari Ois, He Start of Anecho, Hoisi Nivol, Elecho, Adinoi Ekro, Bel Adinoi Eschanon. Ma Betza Bedomi, Briditi El Shachas, Hayedcho Ofar, Hayagid Amitacha. Shma Adinoi Vechoneni, Adinoi, Heye Oizer Li. Hafachta, Misbidi, Lemacholi, Pitachta Saki, Vataz, Reni Simcha, Lemani Zamercha, Havoid, Velo Yidoim, Adinoi Lehai, Lo Elom, Eideka. Thank you very, very much, Rabbi Levitansky, on behalf of the entire community. Wish you tremendous Hatzlacha Rabba. We should, as you said, visit you in your Shalim or Kedash. Um, right. If there's anything the community could do in a particular level besides just this donation, but there's something specific you need. Um, on a larger level, something that you want us to raise for, please, please let us know. And uh, we're here for you. And we give you way more than thanks for spending this hour with us. Thank you very, Thank you very much. I uh, cannot stress enough how much it helps when people do another mitzvah, say another prayer, another capital tehillim um, for the Jews of Ukraine. The people here, they hear about it. They know what's happening. Um, I just had a Zoom with the community in South Africa, Cape Town, Johannesburg, and they opened up a WhatsApp group, uh, mitzvahs I'm doing for, for Ukraine. It's full, it got full in about 10 minutes. Um, and, and people from my community see these things. They see this person is putting on tefillin. He wasn't doing it before, he's doing it for Ukraine. This person put up a mezuzah for your safety. It gives them incredible strength. It's something, I, I can't say it enough. I, I, I'm saying it because this is what I'm hearing from the people here. Um, I sent out a video to my community of a hundred boys in a yeshiva in Brooklyn saying to Hillam, it's a minute video that's gone viral. It has thousands of, of views and people are just saying, this is why we're still alive. This is why we're here. This is what's this is what's keeping us going, and this is what's giving us strength. So I, I can't say it enough. I'm reiterating it again and again and again. Of course, tzedakah is important, and giving money, and we need, we need money, and tzedakah is important anyway, and it's a good mitzvah to do, even if it's not for this cause, it's for another cause. 
um, any mitzvah that you can do, especially for the people of Ukraine, this will definitely help. And it will also definitely bring Mashiach, which is going to solve this problem immediately. Amen. Thank you very, very much. Uh, if people have supplies, sorry, or, you know, I'll write to you personally about this. Okay. Shakar Gadol. Anybody who reached out to me and have things that they can help with as well, please write to me offline and I'll put you in touch with Rabbi Levitansky and we'll see what we can do. Thank you so, so much. Shakar Gadol. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Thank you, everybody, for joining.